Good morning, good morning. Welcome back to a look behind the post. We've had a, a couple of weeks of a break, um, but I'm very happy and, uh, to have my guest on this week. He's someone I, I look up to an awful lot online. He really knows what he talks about because he seems to live and breathe it. Uh, my guest this week um, is a, another crypto maniac, uh, Bill Wilmont. Bill, welcome to a look behind the post. Yeah, thanks there. I appreciate yeah, that nice introduction. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, never, you're never planned. <laughs> you just come out. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, thanks for the call. And uh, well, welcome. thanks for inviting me here tonight. I do appreciate the offer. Um, I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. And hopefully, your listeners will enjoy it. Well, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. You're always very knowledgeable. Like, so, someone's going to get value from it. Cool. Excellent. Okay. But um, just for the people watching at home that, that don't know you, yeah. can you give me a little bit of background of like uh, kind of the, the space you're in and how you got started and you know, your, your own little personal journey? Well, I've got a big question and you know, where do I start? You know, so um, probably my, if I start with the offline stuff. So uh, my background is financial services, so traditional financial services offline. Uh, so I work for a very large I guess, blue chip company in the UK for a long, long time. I started when I was 17 years old. In fact, it was the 10th of August, 1980. I know the exact date <laughs> about that. And uh, it's kind of an interesting question because we're looking today at technology and how it changes our lives and how it's going to change our lives going into the future. And I'll, I'll just give you, give you a quick example of that. When I first joined it, the, the company I work with, um, they didn't really have computers in the way we do today. So it's very much make, you know, sort of mainframe computers, and you'd have a VDU, and you'd share that with other people. There were no personal computers. There were no iPhones, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it was very basic, and people still smoked in the office in those days. That's how long ago it was, yeah? Which never happens really in the UK today. So I was a, a spotty teenager who knew nothing, and my only interest in life were basically the pub, going out with my mates, motorcycles and women. Yeah, and really, I just wanted to earn enough money to have fun. Yeah. I had no real great vision of what I wanted to do. I just wanted the money uh, to allow me to get the things I wanted to enjoy in my life, yeah? So I was a very unknowledgeable, you know, pretty useless teenager, really, yeah? Um, so that, that's how my life started out. So. The reason I wanted to mention this is because we're looking today at a massive change in technology that's going to change our lives. It has been for years through phones and things like it. Um, I remember on the TV, for example, when I was a young, youngster, we had two channels, I think it was. BBC yeah. One, <laughs> then BBC Two came along, and then we had ITV. <laughs> now we've got Sky with thousands of channels, yeah? And the choices are pretty much unlimited. And we can stream it for a phone, yeah? Yeah. I only went traveling a few years ago. I was a backpacker, yeah, that's quite a long time ago now. And I had a smartphone, a smart, it was a Sharp GX10. It had a video, but it was very shady. You couldn't see anything, yeah? And today, you can take one of these phones and stream video across the world. Yeah. I didn't think that would ever happen. When I was much younger, my sister said, that's going to come, because she used to work in IT. I thought, no, it's never going to work. Yeah? How can you make that video work across the whole world? It's not going to yeah. happen. But I want to give you a real good analogy. My first job, I was the, the new guy on the department, and uh, my job was to pick out these cards because it was an insurance company. At least my part was insurance, and we had a we had a card for every policy number in the company. The cards were this size, yeah, right. So, and uh, my job was to basically um, go and find the request for my peers or my um, the more expensive people. And they put a request in every day for the cards they needed to carry the claims. Yeah. So the ladies would order her, then it was uh, maybe the rain and all the others. And I'd go and get these requests, click them all in, and then go to this massive machine called a card veyor. It was the size of a 3.5 transit van. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's how big it was. And I used to walk up on top of it. So imagine some steps going up onto the platform, and you're now this high up off the ground. And in front of you, you have this big sort of um, rotary system of trays. And then a big keyboard in the middle with big plastic numbers. That, you know, and basically, let's say, for example, you're looking for a, a card starting with number 8,000. You type in 800, it rotate round. So all the trays has been displayed, started with 800. And then you go and find the card, 
and replace it with the bring out for Denise and then go and take that card to Denise. That was my first job, guys. Okay. <laughs> that was cutting edge technology back in 1980. Yeah. Now, sometimes it would break down. And guess what? It had a cranking lever. No <laughs> They're not joking. So I used to get this crank and then manually move it around so I could get to the card. That was my first experience. Oh, job. <laughs> Can you imagine a, a kid today doing that job? Well, yeah, you tell kids that they, they won't believe you, will they? No. no. <laughs> so um, it was, an, you know, I look back, I suppose, and I look at things like that, and I think how lucky we are today to have the technology we have, really, and the leverage it gives us because, you know, we're, we're able to have calls like this across the world to yeah. run our internet businesses, yeah? We can do Zooms, you know, we can do them pretty much lying on the sofa in front of the TV at the same time. It does happen on Zoom, doesn't it? You've got some, some wise guy who's having, watching EastEnders while you're trying to do a Zoom call and he doesn't mute himself, does he? <laughs> or he's having an argument with somebody. Well, you know? So, uh, I mean, it just kind of tell, shows you how far we've come and it probably gives you an indication of how far we yet we have to go. Because the challenges going forward will be AI, robotics, all these kind of things, yeah? Yeah. The jobs we do today will be different in 10 years' time massively. Go back 10, 20 years and see what changes has happened. Online shopping was never there. It's no. transforming the high street. People are losing the job because of it. So you can't ignore the truth. And the truth is that we're going to have to change in order to create income for ourselves. We can't just rely on that sole income stream from my job or any business, whether you're self-employed or whatever. You need to have multiple income streams, yeah? And I'm, I'm sure your, your mindset is in the same place as mine is, that you need to have those. Otherwise, you're putting yourself at risk, essentially. Yeah? 100%. So I don't know if that's a good start or not, but um, that's what that's what I wanted to say today because I've just seen so much change. And, you know, I, I look at the future, my kid particularly, who are 10 and 8, yeah, and they're smart boys. I'm thinking, what jobs are they going to be doing in the future? So I'm already educating them about things I've learned. And I would guess the, my learning curve was pretty poor. I mean, when we go back to the first time we started online, I, my analogy is quite simple. I had a, a series of humbling experiences, yeah? Right. Because I, I, I um, came from financial services. I was in compliance during the last crash. Um, basically, I had, a, I had a, a home-based business. It was selling houses, yeah? So I bought a, a franchise, yeah? So I was the guy who would come to your house and value a house and sell it for you. I had no expert at all in selling. I never thought a house before up on my own. I thought, how hard can it be? And it wasn't particularly hard. It was hard in terms of effort and work, all those kind of things, but actually it wasn't that hard at all. The hardest bit was getting that first customer. Yeah. I'd like walk into a house, I'd go to a right move and value the house, you know, and get a series of valuations, and I'd do some research, and I'd go to the house, and oh, I've got a presentable guy here, yeah, and I thought I'd be all right. And I would then do my pitch as such. It's quite a simple one. I'm cheaper than the rest because you're paying two to three percent for your fee. I'm going to charge you 0.5. Now I was working from home for the internet. I didn't need a, a show, you know, a show room. Yeah. It goes to white move anyway. Yeah. So you don't really need a, 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 a place on the high street. So what would happen is I go in and give my price. It might be two in the grand on a nice little two bed. And they go, thanks, Bill, but you're obviously new. What will they do? We're going to get some quotes from Romans. And then I get a call back saying, oh, we're going to Romans because they're more experienced. I said, well, hang on a minute. The reason that you're going with them actually is not because of that, because they're giving a higher price. Because what they've done, they come in and see me, I give them 200, and they slap 20 grand on the price. Yeah? Yeah. Only to get the business. And then they sign them up to a 16-week contract, four months, yeah? And over the next four months, they're going to bring the price down to where I buy price so they can sell it because they're not going to get in, into the 220. Yeah. So this is the thing I faced. I thought, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to ask you to sign a contract at all. I'm going to ask you to give me two weeks. No contract. Still the fee, even, you know, 0.5%. I yeah. haven't got your interest in two weeks. Yeah. Then you can go to the other guys. Yeah. And I sold them in two weeks every time. No way. Yeah. So that's how the bigger guys do it then, is it? Well, they are desperate to get the business, so they would do anything 
to get the business. And but my experience, that's what happened. It, they were simply putting up the price to get the business. So they would say, right, you know, Mr. Walmart has given you 200K. We think he's underpriced it quite a lot, actually. Give us 220, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And then, of course, the, the person who owns the house is going to go, yeah, I like the sound of that one a lot better. Yeah, yeah. and there's a sing- there'll be a single, um, a single contract for them only, so they, they charge you a bit less. If it goes to multi-agency, they charge you more, you see, yeah? So there's there's lots of tricks they would try, including throwing my signboard into the river and things like that, you know? This all disappears suddenly, you know. Uh, well, I did that for a little while actually. It was quite successful because I I started to do, do that in 0607. and I remember 07 because the market was nuts. I mean, anyone who could have sold has in the market. A two hundred grand house, well, flat or sorry, um, sort of two bed terrace was going for two hundred k here. By August, it was two fifty. No way. It was nuts, absolutely nuts. And they're nice houses, but they were you know it's a lot of money. And I remember because I had quite a good uh, space that I looked after, you know, and I remember sitting on the airfield here, the highest priced two bedroom house, because the, the owner wanted 239. I said, it's really high. <laughs> it's gonna take some time. It did take time, we've got 239, yeah? It was the highest selling house on the airfield. And straight after that, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the story. In September 07 in the UK, we had massive storms here. My, my mum got flooded nearby, yeah? I had to go over there. I had to walk through rivers and get a tractor through to get to her. And they, they were underwater a long way, yeah. And then in September, just after that, um, Northern Northern Rock suddenly closed their doors because they were Ill- illiquid. They couldn't keep going, yeah. Right. And a year a year later, the government bailed them out. And basically, in September seven, the market started to pull away, pull down. I could see it happening. And everyone said it's going to be okay, but I thought it's not going to be okay. So I went and got a job, yeah, and I put this on ice, yeah. And I went to work for a, a big compliance company, American one. I can't mention the name, uh, NDA stuff, unfortunately. But um, I went in there because it was an interview. I hadn't been for interview for years, yeah. I mean, I didn't really do interviews. They just, I got calls and they, they come and work for us. Yeah, it's not nice, actually. Same but yeah, basically, <laughs> I went for this test interview because I haven't been up for ages, and it was for a business analyst role, um, and it was doing websites, which I knew nothing about at all. Okay, <laughs> so, I went to this interview and it went really well, and they said, "Okay, fantastic, well, I'll give you a call." So the next day, the employment agency rings me up, said, "How do you think it went?" I said, "Pretty well. Went really well, Bill. They want to see you again." Because during the meeting, they said, "Well, I used to be a manager." Uh, would you consider being a manager again? I said, well, if the right role came up, possibly, yeah? So the next day, the, the director flies down to, to Farnborough, to, to down here. He flies down from, from uh, Sheffield, yeah. And we're having this now really good conversation interview with him. And I came out of that interview with a new job and 50 grand a year plus bonuses. And I thought, I well, I knew nothing about the job, yeah? I was uh, probably underqualified for it, but they they bought me from my management skills, really. But to cut a long story short, it was a mess. It really was a mess, yeah. Um, I'll just give you one example of things. I'm, I'm used to, obviously, managing risk, okay? That's my background. I'm not formally qualified, but that's what I did at my old company when I, before I left there. And um, basically, I found that we're in the IT department, and I was running a web, web team, and they'd had all these contractors, 16 contractors doing the work. When I came in, there was four that were left. All that was gone, because it was a recession, they're cutting back and things like that. But what I found out about a year after being there, that we had to do an audit, and they'd had outsourced all the work to another company. And when they outsourced it, they completely overlooked my team. So we had a web development team with a, 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 a what do you call it, a development server, and a, and a a live server right. and they hadn't been backed up for 18 months so i mean nothing was been updated from microsoft at all so i reported it into my, on my list of issues <laughs> and they said well, you have to try and fix it bill i said well i've got four people that you've got two things here i can either put the people i've got on it and that means they can't do the products they're supposed to be doing here for new customers or we go and get someone to pay to do it and it's going to cost 10 grand we haven't got a budget I think that was the last straw, really, because I'm very particular about the way I work. Yeah. yeah. And in the end, they said, okay, I think it was about time you moved on. Here's some money, go away. 
because I, I i'm i like to be transparent yeah yeah i don't like to sweep things under the carpet and sometimes that gets me in trouble but i can't i can't not be who i am yeah no like you're always better off being honest and transparent it's so that's not going to hurt yeah. your business when you do that <laughs> yeah it's not going to happen yeah exactly so um just a little taste of things people, like that. people mightn't like it but i don't think it'll hurt your i wouldn't say it wouldn't hurt my business if i'm honest because you have to be honest yeah yeah people might want to hear what you're saying that's, that's the only thing well exactly yeah you need to be i mean I, it's, it has got me hot water before i've been poured into meetings over the years that i'd rather not be in thanks very much yeah yeah um, because i'm not i'm not pc yeah i don't do pc yeah um and to be fair because i knew, know my stuff normally people respect that anyway and i tell the truth um so as i said normally what happens is i tell the truth and sooner or later that that person gets sacked yeah because on one occasion i had a director working well she's my director and she was a power mad person completely nuts in my opinion and she hauled me over the calls one time quite publicly um but she couldn't sack me because i was technically right yeah and eventually she got her fired for fraud so there you go no way hmm. did, did, it, did it stop at a fine or no, I don't, I don't, the whole family was involved because they were, she'd given contracts to her family, I think her husband, and he was doing some piece of work. It was, it was all very, all okay by head office, but yeah. they found they were adding a penny, a penny onto each transaction. Yeah, they shouldn't have been. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure to tell these things live, really, but um, so don't tell you the word. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean, there's, um, there's no names mentioned, so I don't think I'll come back. But yeah, I mean, that was a long time ago. Um, and, uh, but you know, sometimes you have you go through periods in your life when you're not in a good place because of the people you're working with and yeah. then it and then it turns around and suddenly all that bad piece is taken away and then you're you come out of it smiling because people saw you stand your ground and say the right thing and do the right thing yeah yeah and uh it's important to be straightforward and honest with people i think whatever the outcome might be yeah you can't not be yourself yeah, it was, it's one of the one of the reasons why i asked you to come on and one of the reasons why i respect you because you just you just give the answer plain and simple whether someone likes it or not that's something i really admire in a person because a lot of people just want to go along and be a yes man and they kind of just want you just just say what the other per, what they think the other person wants to hear you never you never get that with you well you know that's nice to say so um uh i mean the way i look at it, I, I suppose um everyone's brought up in a certain way by their parents you see and uh you know that you those values you normally hold throughout your life and the people you associate with and i think probably that's where why i'm the way i am i mean when i talk about online my dad's passed away years ago yeah when i was 30 yeah it was a long time ago i'm 55 now and um that was a tough time for me very tough i was in a mess i'm not like, i didn't do anything stupid i just really lost a lost a wolf of life in it for a while yeah yeah and um he was a big piece of my my uh me really so when i when i'm on, online and you know i'm seeing what's going on i've got this moral backbone and i can't do things that i don't think are ethical it's just part of me i mean i've made mistakes you know i've backed the wrong horses but i don't it's gonna have to keep making the same mistakes i have backed the wrong wrong businesses i've made money from you know ponzi by mistake really not knowing any different but uh I put that behind me and I had a tough time once, once or twice and I've made a big change in my life and it would be very easy for me to go back to that because you know let's face it we all need money but I'm not gonna uh put my reputation on the line just for money yeah I'd rather go back to work yeah. and yeah. That. so that's where I am so you won't find me supporting those types of things um I I don't call them out because otherwise I'd be called a hater yeah and then my profile dead isn't it really but uh I, I, there's a bit of me sometimes who wants to do that, but I won't do it publicly because basically it just becomes very messy and unnecessary. Um, I think most people know exactly what they're doing, yeah? yeah. Um, certainly certain leaders in the businesses they are in, they know exactly what they're doing, and all they're really after is your commission check. Yeah. They have no interest in you at all, and uh, they will not support you once you've paid your money. Yeah. And I'm not going to name because they know <laughs> <laughs> there's no yeah. need to mention names but uh this business is a full of a range of people uh who, who all have different uh senses of what's right and wrong yeah 
Yeah. And it's, well, my best advice I can give is think like a dragon. Now, I'm not saying one minute that Peter, Peter Jones has become either joy your business. That's not going to happen. But you <laughs> need to try and think clever, think smart, and think like a business person. Would they invest in this business? Is there enough credible evidence to support that business as an investment? Now, it's not about jumping in and hoping you're going to stick to the person who's rec recruited you, and maybe some money will drop on your head and you can take that away. And good income. Isn't it going to happen? You're, you might be only spending 10, 20, 30 dollars at a time, but add it all up over the years, it adds up to a lot of money. It does, yeah. So you have to think you know, properly, carefully about what you're doing and also the people leading to that business. Now, I'm not saying you do it on purpose, I'm saying accidents happen, but you can't keep repeating the same ones because people will stop to follow you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't do a, a lot of online business really, and I just post anecdotes now and again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I'm not probably as experienced as you are in terms of how to market online, in terms of building lists and stuff like that. I'm kind of a hybrid person. I like to talk to people. I do go and meet people. I do do meetings. Probably not as many as I should do. And uh, because I think you need to get out from your cubicle here and here and go and see what, actually yeah, you need to you need to really connect with people. The shoulder, yeah. Yeah. Because these days people do obviously do a lot of online stuff, but sometimes they feel the need to go to a meeting and check it out for themselves. Yeah. They look at the whites of people's eyes. Are they really the people that they appear to be when they're online? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that can give a good feeling about someone and, and your gut is normally quite accurate. I find um, with things. When I was once asked a presentation for a company who was failing miserably, this is years ago, and I refused because we weren't, we weren't getting paid. I was asked to go onto the meeting and say, everything's okay. Yeah, <laughs> you can't do that. This is going back to sort of 14 around that time. Yeah, so that's a long time ago. Uh, but really, I mean, I'm a good space now. I mean, my life changed really a few years ago uh, when I aligned with my current company. And uh, I, um, I dabbled in gold back in 2012, 13. The gold was a bull run. And I bought gold from a certain company, it took four months to arrive. So I didn't promote that company. Uh, but this particular company, I've been now for a long time. They have a good track record. They're not perfect because I don't think you can, you can uh, not one single network marketing company is perfect. There's always something missing. It could be the fact that the CEO is not very visible. It could be the fact that comp plan is quite complicated. It could be that there's, there's um, a lack of training material, anything, but they're yeah. never perfect. You can't expect to look upon them like a corporate company with ultimate massive resources, yeah. And you'll find that most compensation plans are, are really designed to lace the pockets of the company, not you. And yeah. the binary is a typical example. Binary is a killer for most people, and I'll tell you why because you have a power leg and a weak leg, yeah, every single time. And all the sales are going, you have one big sales team down here who are making shitloads of money, yeah. This is like 200 grand coming down this leg. And you've got to try and find people to put in your inside leg. And when you face that decision, it's very hard, particularly if you're new, because if you just started that and you're getting some success, you've got to put your guys you can't recruit into the weak leg. Because yeah. you know the network is what they'd be in the, in the power leg, because that's where the money is. So your best mates end up being in the, uh, in the, in the weak leg, and it's not right. So yeah. I was a, a great uh, binary uh, business a few years back, and I... Uh, I invested in it, but I didn't actually promote it because I knew I'd have to put my guys that aren't very good at networking into that week. And that's why I didn't do it. Yeah. So um, I, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, what, what I do because obviously you can put them in bold. If I know someone isn't a particularly good team builder, I'll put them in that, that power leg. Mm. And the guys that I know that can go out and will make videos and, and, and go to work, yeah. I'll put them in, in the other leg. Well, yeah, that's the thing. But when you, when people, if you, if you speak to proper networkers and a lot of people are good at what they're doing, they always ask you, "Where well, are you in the power leg?" I want to be. I want to be in the power leg. I wasn't coming in. Yeah, it's not unusual. Let's put it that way. Um, but you see, you have got binaries that have uh, check matches as well. So that means when you've got two legs, if you've got a check match and you're putting people in the side, you're still getting a check match on the other side. So yeah. you still got paid some money. So it depends on the the kind of structure of the binary you're in, they do some wonderful things sometimes with comp plans. Yeah, but the yeah. fundamental thing to remember is that most of the time, 
you have this thing called um, breakage, which is where if it's a legitimate company and they have fully costed the comp plan, yeah, if you aren't hitting the ranks in your particular spot in the business, where does the money go? It goes to the company and they have yeah. a choice. They can put it back in again if they want to, or they can hold on to it. Uh, and I, I'll leave you to make the conclusion. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, so easier. Some people love binaries. I mean, I'm not saying I don't love them. I'm just saying they do have their drawbacks. Yeah. Um, I would prefer other structures over binaries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we, we're sort of digressing into things that we weren't probably going to discuss. But um, coming back to the point, so I'm a kind of hybrid person. I do some offline, some online, some video. And I do some um, landing pages and things like that. Um, so I guess I'm a of a mixed breed really in terms of how i operate um but i should do more online stuff the trouble is i've got so much information in my head i want to impart and i sometimes struggle with where where do i start with this particularly around goal which i'm hugely passionate about but most people find incredibly boring yeah have you ever considered doing like a, a weekly show or a podcast just about gold no, no, I don't. I've got this idea. I'm, I'm going to start doing it. I've got, I had an idea, which I'm not going to tell you about because I don't want to give it away. Uh, <laughs> but I, I've got some examples of real life sort of, a, of a situations where gold can be used as a comparison of value. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm going to because I don't want to give the cup to think. We've got a meeting coming from London. Yeah. And uh, this company I'm working with on the 23rd of March. Yeah. And, and you're in that company, so you should, well, you can't get it. You're in Ireland, aren't you? I just want to fly yeah. in. I mean, even if you're flying, it'd be a good day out for you, I'm sure, because you meet the owners. But the point is that um, I've got these great ideas, and I'm just trying to decide how to share them, yeah? Um, I, I, um, I'm a stay-at-home dad, so my wife, my wife has her own business, so she's rarely here. And um, the way her business works is it's a social business, that people tend to want to use her services of her business after hours, yeah. So it's normally around lunch time onwards when they finish work. And she's really good at what she does, and she's well under paid in my view. But I'll, I'll come back in a second. But <laughs> um, that means I do the pickups from school, I do the homeworks, I do the teas, I do the bedtimes, yeah, yeah. And uh, at the weekends, like today, she's been working. What day is the day? Saturday today. Yeah, today she's been working. <laughs> Tomorrow she is because that's when she gets a little customer. She's a, she does Thai massage. She's from Thailand, yeah. Right. And uh, she's been in Covent Garden working on a very large company up there. Got all, all the knowledge from there. She's really good at what she does, but she wanted to open her own place, and um, she's renting now in, in a very nice place in a very nice place in near London, yeah. Right. And um, I think she likes the place more because it's quite a villagey boutique kind of place the the, the actual um the, the uh it's in windsor i'll say that it's in windsor it's easy yeah. there's a really? no place yeah to work but the trouble is you know you're you've got very high rents you're competing with all the bigger companies one's just moved in and spent 100 grand on their on their premises you know to me you know it's very hard to compete with that sort of money and i don't want to spend that sort of money in this market yeah yeah uh, but yes, so my challenge really is I'm trying to balance my home-based business around my kids and my wife and everything that's going on. And that, that can be a challenge sometimes, to be fair, yeah? But so uh, I'm trying to educate my children, particularly my son who's 10, who's very smart and picks up things quickly. And I might actually bring him a call one day. I'm trying to explain to him about gold and silver. I'm waiting for him to say something at school at the moment. He's going to say something soon, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and uh, that that is my passion. But my the business I'm in has restructured uh, in a certain way, they they started out as a precious metals company, uh, and what's really critical for me is that when you talk about networking companies, they don't always break into the the mainstream. Yeah, yeah. This company were able to uh, get a license with the largest refiner of precious metals in the world. So over here, you got this network marketing company. Oh, bad thing! Don't go near there. <laughs> you know. <laughs> This is a pyramid, that sort of question. Yet, they've got a license with the uh, largest refiner of precious metals in the world, Argo Jerez, yeah? That doesn't happen easily, if at all, yeah? And if a roll forward to the day, we are now part of a company, an energy company, 
who've got 20 years experience behind them who really know what they're doing. So all the uh, assets I'm talking about are hard physical assets. These are things that you dig out the ground, they're natural resources. And my income comes from that, okay? So we're talking about oil and gas. Yeah, exactly, yes. It's oil, it's gas, and natural gas, solar power, so wind, solar, uh, tidal power, and then we've got minerals as well. And we've got a mineral project in Peru uh, in, in conjunction with the Peruvian government, and it's a 200 million project, yeah? And it's 200 miles by 50 miles wide. And it will probably take about 100 years to fully, you know, um, monetize that site. So I'm not saying it takes 100 years to get paid out. I'm saying it takes 100 years to complete the project. Yeah. But we'll be done in gone by the time that happens. So we're talking about generational wealth. Yeah. Not cash, just as far as cash. It's cash today for commissions, as you would expect. But it's a long term generational wealth and income plan. So I'm not building a, a business for a few months. I'm building this for many, many years. So my kids can basically benefit from that wealth creation. Yeah. Yeah. And um, take ownership of those assets, those shares I will have in the years to come. Because I'm, I'm a stakeholder in the business. I own shares. Yeah. Yeah. And my passive income comes from the shares. My capital growth comes from the shares. Yeah. So it's like an IPO but on the blockchain. Yeah. That's why that's what I call it. Most people know what I've got an IPO is, you know, and you've seen them mention the news. We're simply using blockchain technology to, to overcome the, um, the sharing of profits, really, if you like, yeah? Yeah. And we, how we just do yeah. profits as well. So um, I like that because that means that, well, I have a plan now which may well fund my kids, you know, uh, um, schooling or uh, further education into uni if they want to do that. Maybe when they come to buy their first house, that means I'm going to have some cash aside over here that I can put towards that. Yeah. Yeah. But the whole point is I'm going to try and educate them on the take it to the, to the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Me, you know, I'm 55 years old. I haven't got much time left really in, in years, have I? I mean, perhaps 30, 45 years. But this business will still be paying me, you see. And then they can take it over. Yeah. Yeah. See. So, and that's it's a nice motivation then as well because you, you know you can pass it on to the kids well i think probably most people have the same motivation the question is you know do they have the right uh platform to get there yeah yeah because yeah. i do a bit of forex and we, we were talking about trading earlier um I, I used to trade oil and gas back what, 10 years ago it must be 10 years ago now yeah and uh, so that's wti and crude oil and I enjoyed that, but I was at the PC all the time. I didn't really want to do that, really. I might, I am actually going back to it just because I think it's nice to have a skill. So I want to relearn that skill. Yeah. And I will call up my bread and butter money. I do that in the morning after they go to school and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, learning, I'm learning myself at the minute. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I think it's a good thing to do. Um, so that's, that will be another income stream for me. But um, it's really just trying to cherry pick the best things I can see out there that. I think will be a good addition to my portfolio. I'm not interested in, in fast cash. Uh, I want to see absolute proof of what's going on. Yeah, I won't move without it. And that might mean I'm ultra cautious, but I don't need to take massive risk at my age. Yeah, I'm in Bitcoin, but I don't think Bitcoin is my only income stream. Um, I think that we've seen a massive bull run in Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, you've got to be looking for sustainable income. Bitcoin is only sustainable if the price is the right price and the difficulty factor is at the right place. If those conditions aren't met, it becomes unsustainable. So that's why the whole industry collapsed because, you know, whether you believe it or not, that price was forced down by the market. It was manipulated. Yeah. And they're going to use the futures market, in my opinion, to, to con continue manipulating the price. Yeah. So I, I think yeah, well, until until they have enough of it st stockpiled it's worth their while then i think they'll let it go well if they can if they can do it they will continue doing it they think it with gold for years gold is heavily manipulated right um and if you look at the the actual on the chart the curves of the uh gold and, and the silver against bitcoin they're very similar in the structure yeah, yeah? that's not a coincidence <laughs> it can't be you can't agree because of this. So I, I believe there is market suppression going on, and I do believe that will continue um, because they are going to be creating their own instruments behind this, and they will want you to buy those off them, yeah? They don't want Bitcoin, really. The only thing that might change, that I think, and 
I'm not saying this is going to happen forever. I think Bitcoin will be suppressed, but it will it will go up over time. It might just take a lot longer than two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it may be forced upon us by the next recession, which is going to come probably next two or three years, and that's going to be a very harsh recession and crash. And the reason I the reason I say it's very simple. If you go back to the last recession, we had interest was around five percent. Normally, when we have a crash, what the banks do is they reduce interest rates to stimulate the economy. Because when you reduce interest rates, that people borrow more money, they go and buy a nice brand new car on credit. Yeah, they might buy a new house on the mortgage. They'd have more life, lifestyle money with a credit card. They might start a new business. We, the reducing rates to encourage you to go and borrow and get to more debt. Yeah. Now, given that where we are today, that rates are so low. The only way they can go down is negative interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason they do that is to stop people leaving money in the bank. They want you to go and spend it. There's no point in leaving, right now, there's no real point putting money back anyway. I'll tell you why. But right? if it's minus one percent, then why would you leave it there? You wouldn't. You'd spend it, wouldn't you? Or put it yeah. somewhere else. It's not worth anything. And even today at one percent rates we're getting at the moment. I mean, when you take into account the official end of inflation is about 2.3 percent or something stupid yeah you're still losing money but i tell you in reality that interest rate that inflation rate is more like five to ten percent per annum yeah because you, you everyone looks at the, what, the cost of living and what they spend their money on their pints their bread their milk it's ridiculously expensive in the uk right now and there's two reasons for that one is the rising price inflation but also in real terms if you go back to 08 i don't think wages have really recovered for the average person yeah no i don't think so either and once you lost their job like me yeah uh, i went and did cleaners for a while would you believe that's how i got into online networking really because my first work from home business was cleaners and i loved that job, that job but the reality is that inflation is much higher than it is and that's going to be the theme of my life thing i talk about is inflation because it's a it's a hidden tax in a way um and it's killing your income more than you expect it to be you don't probably realize how much money you're losing due to inflation yeah and that's how gold can help you because it basically it's a great store of value and i'm not going to give away what my thing what to hold that back <laughs> okay but i'll be watching right i'll be watching <laughs> i'm sure you will but uh yeah but you don't have to clean you see i mean Good friend. Well, in fact, uh, it's a good friend of mine now. I, I'm my sponsor in case he brought me in back at a time where I had no money coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've never done anything like this before. So I went out to clean easy and I really enjoyed it because two things happened. I got really fit because I like to, I like, I'm an active person. Yeah. And I sit on a computer all day, you know, and it's, you know, even in my job at home, you're sitting up in a computer all day. You don't, not, not act active you have to force yourself to go out and run around the clock or something yeah but we clean these i was doing a lot of walking and, and when i started it was quite warm so in the summer so I, I i got really fit my my first drop was 300 catalogs i dropped yeah and i got went back the next day or two days later to get pick up the orders i had one order <laughs> yeah. it was three pounds <laughs> fifty it's funny because years ago I did clean easy. And I, I only lasted about three months though. Oh really? Really? Yeah. Oh, I, 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 when the door, kind of door to door catalogs weren't really working, I started to try and have these uh, like parties at the weekend. Yeah. Where, you know, I'd, I'd make my aunties, you know, bring over their friends. I, and that. I, I it was like just it. terrible. It was just yeah. terrible. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what happened to me. I, I, I went out. I dropped these three in the catalogs. I love it. It's a sunny day. Yeah, it was great. And I went about three pound fifty. I didn't have anything, I didn't have a job, yeah. So I wasn't trying to manage to clean these alongside my job. So I thought, what was I carry on? So I did. My sponsor thought I was going to give up straight away. <laughs> well, I kept going and I did well. I mean, I had a really good retail base. So my, where I am, you know, my immediate facility took that over and I started obviously targeting the area that were having catalogs dropped. And I did quite well. And uh, I didn't really mind the weather. I, I liked the challenge of getting those catalogs to the door. You know, avoiding the dogs, that kind of trying to bite your ass, yeah. yeah. And the mad aunt, aunties would come out, but throwing catalogs back at you, that sort of thing. Because that, that happens sometimes, yeah. Because they've been obviously pestered by cleaners over years, and you, the new guy doesn't know they've done this. And you get you innocently walk down a path, you put it for the door, 
and then someone throws it back at you. <laughs> told you before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what happened. Uh, but where I am, I'm, I'm quite in a posh area down the road, and I, I did target that area. And um, it was, and I actually went wider and wider, and I got quite a wide retailer base. And but the big chance was winter, because what would happen is snow and I get wet and cold. But again, I kept going. I didn't give up. I remember trying to get my cut the hill. You now it's spinning like this, and trying to get the, those presents to the kids before it was too late. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I enjoyed that part of it. Um, with the team mill inside, what happened was um, it's really hard to keep people on because when it got cold or wet they would give up because so they, they had full-time jobs and they're trying to bring in an extra income around it so if they've had a full full-on day then they've got to go home and drop the catalogs or pick up the ones or deliver presents and your house kind of turns into this mini mini market where you've got all these plastic bags full of presents that you put together yeah and all the labels and then it, then half the catalogs are getting trashed you know a lot of time you know about the water and the rain and the dogs and so on and I did it for about probably two years, I think it was. Uh, and I did enjoy it, but I had to move on because my wife, wife was not keen about the house being turned into a mini market. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of my time was spent on the TV, you know, reorganizing the catalogs with the clean ones and the dirty ones, putting the slips in. Got to put them in the bag and see. Yeah, yeah, it was time consuming. You know, it's like uh, we talk about, you know, the um, uh, Robert Kawasaki. Yeah. It's also about the, the mindset. You've got employees of employing them, and then you've got, uh, I think, it's business owner and then investor. Yeah. So one of the self-employed person working his ass off, hours and hours and hours of walking around where I live, which I enjoy, to be fair, and dropping catalogs, but also having to spend time in the evenings um, wrapping up presents, making them ready for delivery the next day, or reformatting the catalogs and not nice and tidy. And that was time consuming. Yeah. And you, you can do it because people are very successful. But uh, my wife didn't really like it that much, to be fair. And I, was, I, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't really making my uh, sort of dent on the team building side at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I needed the team building leverage to give me back some time that I could have. Yeah. Because the, the whole idea is that if you, you can have a small retail base, maybe making 500 quid a month. Yeah. And then build up a team. Because some people are making forty grand a month, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I moved on online, and that's how I got to be around today, really. Um, but I wouldn't just call myself online. I'm a bit of a bit of everything, really. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's obviously why a lot of people respect you because you will go and meet them, or you will jump on a call with them. It's not just that's the page. Put in your email. See you on the other side. You, you actually help people. Yeah. Well, I. I suppose that's just in my makeup. I mean, in my job, I was a trainer, I was a coach, I was a manager. So I guess that's part of it. You can't, you have to be who you are. You can't pretend to be someone else, yeah? Yeah. Um, in this business. So, uh, I mean, it obviously it does kind of have its negatives, I suppose, because I don't publicly put my phone number on Facebook so you can just ring me. I actually give it out selectively because I know what would happen. I get every man who's dogging me up, yeah? Yeah, there's some right weirdos out there. <laughs> you know, you got to be careful, yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the people who know me well, they, they, they can ring me up and they've got a question. They have my phone number, yeah. Yeah. I've got a, a group of people I've got to know quite well over the last two or three years over my networking experiences, yeah. And they're in my still my team today, so they they've done very well through my current company, yeah. And they're very pleased. Some came in a bit late, and they're obviously a bit miffed, but. I don't think they hold me responsible for that because I always make it very clear with any investment you do, you have to assume the worst because we are in a high the internet marketing is risky as it is. Yeah. Bitcoin crypto is like double, double, double risky, isn't it? It's like the worst risk in the world. Yeah. Because it's so volatile. So my view is look, if you're going to invest in anything in this space, you have to assume the worst because the money's gone tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually it's one of the reasons that well, there's, I've, I've, I've heard you say that before and there's a couple of other marketers that I, I really respect and lately you know a lot of people have been talking about this like knowing the risks and yeah so I, I started to put a disclaimer in in my videos as, as well as saying like you you need to understand this is not a guarantee you know you need to do your own due diligence but you know you have to let people know that because some people do sell it as a guarantee 
regardless of what the business is or the model. They'll be like, oh no, you just started, you know, you'll be making 10 grand next month. You can't tell people that. Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're the people we don't want in this business, really, aren't they? I mean, yeah. they, they say anything to get a sale. And yeah. uh, it's not about that. It's, it, this whole business is about building relationships today for the future. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, some people just look at, you know, their their referrals, if you like, as income producing assets. That's all. All they want is the money. And fundamentally, you've got to obviously pay yourself first. You, you, you're no good to anyone if you can't sustain an income that pays you because you can't help them because you'll be you'll be all stressed out and not thinking properly yeah and we've all gone through times when our businesses are taking a dip yeah because change happens not because the the company's bad not because the company is the wrong company it's because they need to adapt yeah yeah so particularly if they got you know they want to move their business in, the, in a new direction and make it more diversified but fundamentally um I I tend to be trying to get the podcast to everyone, and so it's quite direct. I say, look, you've got to share the worst that you're going to, going to lose it all tomorrow. I say that because some people aren't that really, they're quite almost novices in the space. Yeah, they haven't really considered risk at all before because they haven't invested before in anything. Yeah, apart from maybe their pension, and we'll come back to pension in a minute if I stop buying to work in pensions. Um, so with my current thing i do i would say you could probably take a different view on that because it is it's got a lot of information there for you to make an informed decision yeah i would, I would call that low risk because of the assets we have yeah they're not these are assets you use in the house i mean you use natural gas in your house to power electricity yeah you use um you know diesel and things like this to power heaters and things yeah you've got gas in your hob yeah You've got, you know, you've got um, fuel that goes in the car, the diesel and petrol, yeah? Your water, the water you, you know, comes from your tap. We, we do water refining. Those are all things that you, you actually need to live on. So they're essential things on this earth that come from the natural resources. I'm not going to go out of fashion tomorrow. So in my mind, that is low risk. And because they've had a track record of, in, in, in some, um, the oil and natural gas, they've been paying it for 80 years on the site, yeah? Goes back to the late twenties, yeah, and projected it's going for another 20, 30 years, yeah. Now that's not it's not going to make you a millionaire a night, but it's what we're looking for. We're looking for, you know, sustainable long term income, and you only have to pay once. You don't have to pay more. You don't, yeah. have, to pay, you don't have to pay monthly. You don't have to pay lots of money. You can just choose your own budget and off you go. So the point I'm trying to make is that in most cases I say a blanket is assumed the worth because. They're not hitting in this space before. They don't know what's going on, probably. But then again, you could argue that if you've got a proper company, which is called a mainstream products are there, you could say, I have more information there in which I can then make a decision. Yeah. But equally, the same applies. You've got to assume, you've got to find out where your risk profile is. How much can I lose before I start to feel sick? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or before it's it starts to hurt financially, yeah? It's different for everyone. It is, yeah. That's so, that point is different for everyone. Exactly, but it, you, you, you've got to give it consideration. You know, um, well, I've done forks before. I've done quite well at forks before, like the investment side as opposed to the trading side. But even then, you know, I said the same thing. You've got to see the worst scenario, and you lose it tomorrow. And I, I remember, I um, when I first started online, I didn't know anything, and I thought those people on YouTube really knew what they're talking about. Yeah, because they seem so professional. Yeah. So I I um I put some money into a company called Banners Broker, yeah. Oh, about a year ago. I rocked that, and before that, I was pitched on Zeke Rewards, yeah, which I missed because of a bang before I got in, and then I was shown another another company like Zeke Rewards, and I put some money into that one, not a huge amount, and within three days, I think it or two days. They completely restructured their business because they saw Zeke go down. So they immediately restructured their business. I couldn't get money out. You had to, you know, it would take, take 50 years to get the cash out because they had to re restructure it. So, and it's the same person pretty much who showed me all three of them. Yeah. yeah. And, um, or at least one of them had told them. So the point is that um, it's a steep learning curve. Yeah. And 
And I thought with the revenue share for Monsoon, I was in, in, in a small way into that one. I got to the point where I'd worked out, because I invested most of my money, I have a small team, and they were all ordinary risks, yeah? Uh, and I uh, got to a point where I think I can now start the product show again a month, and then it went like that. So I was about yeah. to start putting TK a month, and it went like that. <laughs> So I, I, I'd made a, a conscious choice a few years ago not to do those things anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you yeah. do you at that point where you go, I need to know everything before I'm happy to, to because you're, you're putting your name to it as well. It's the biggest risk for most people without them realizing it is reputational risk. Yeah. If you keep on choosing the wrong things, you're going to eventually lose your following if you have one at all. And it's going to be harder for you to move forward. Yeah. I mean, there is a sense to me that people are almost like it's an addiction on Facebook. That when you see someone post info only, you know, I mean, it's a bit crazy sometimes that the next sort of cycler or you know whatever it might be, and everyone comes in, they say info, 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 info. Yeah, yeah. And that worries me, yeah, because most of those businesses aren't real business. They're, they're just money machines. There's no product. They're not legal. Yeah, and you've got to really watch what you're doing. Yeah. So um, I think people are so almost involved in trying to make the money, they almost are in a gambling mentality. Yeah. They're almost addicted to the chase, if you like, of making money. And they're just big throwing ten dollars here, twenty there, thirty there. And we follow that they spent a thousand, yeah, every time. Uh the trouble is, you know, to make really make it at this business, you've got to work a lot of hours. You've got to find the right businesses, you've got to have a bit of luck, yeah as well it's all those things and you, you've got to have a never never quit attitude you've got to keep going even when the world's against you yeah 100 percent uh <laughs> yeah, that's what it's like and it will get you down you will be you know i haven't been in tf myself but you know it's it's been tough when you've got two kids when I mean, my kids are eight and ten now i started when i was younger clearly yeah and it's much easier now than it was back then because they were much smaller and younger and need a lot more looking after you know but yeah. um there will be times, you know, where you make sure you think, um, what's the point? <laughs> yeah, I think I've, I've been through some of those um, maybe in the last two years. And I've, I've had many, like uh, last year, I, I, I was suffering, I ended up getting these crazy panic attacks. And there was nothing wrong anywhere. Business was good, work was good, home life was good. I just stopped sleeping and start getting these crazy panic attacks. So I ended up, I switched off everything for about three and a half. And when I came back from that, I thought if, if I'm ever going to quit, it would have been then. Yeah. Like, but you do go through those ups and downs, and it's a part of it. Yeah, you do. You do. Uh, it's just part of life, isn't it? I mean, you know, I think even with my jobs, I mean, I, my job was particularly stressful. I was working seven days a week. Yeah. I was on a project for seven years. The, it was the investigation of personal pensions because the whole industry had been mis-selling. Yeah. Yeah. So every insurance company in the UK was instructed by the regulators back back in what it must have been what is that? There's a long time ago anyway. And they were told without you know any misunderstanding, you must review every single pension you've sold between two dates. I can't remember the dates now, yeah. I was on a six weeks of convent <laughs> and oh, I've been yeah. years, yeah. Uh, and we had complaints coming in over the place, we had lack of resources, we couldn't get the people. We had really, really hard deadlines set for the regular that weren't realistic. We got to the point where we didn't have enough people to do the job. So we had to outsource the work to PwC and Deloitte and Touche, yeah, and another, another company called HCAS. And uh, my job was to prepare the work that went out to those companies. Right. So it was hugely, hugely challenging. And that's why I got into a bit of hot water now and again because I knew the company, I know the business really well. I was right in the hot seat. Yeah. I had to make make it work. I had to create processes by using access databases and Excel here, Excel there. Did it all myself. Right. The team, I built the whole bloody thing for it. Yeah. And I was working seven days a week. Yeah. Plus overtime. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. We used to work. I'm at eight till stupid o'clock in the evening, they're going up and get pissed basically. That's what we did, yeah. That's yeah. how we threw it, yeah. We're, we're getting a lot of paid a lot of money, but we were, I was wrecked. I mean, I, I used to try and play golf every Saturday Saturday afternoon. So I go to work in the morning on Saturday, 
play golf set up and then and sometimes work Sundays. But working Sundays, I mean, if I was doing seven days, it was, it was a kid, I couldn't do many Sundays. Saturday was enough, yeah? Because by Sunday, you need to recharge. You don't get time to recharge. You, you're going on a Monday like a walking dead, yeah? yeah. The body couldn't function anymore, yeah? And I did it for a long time. And uh, and then what happened was, um, what did they do? I think, yeah, I was reallocated. So basically, I, the team I had was disbanded. And then I was put in, in, into like a project management role. So like an account management role. So I was now overseeing these these the actuaries doing the work for us in, in um, PwC and Deloitte and Touche, we outsourced the work to them. So we would send all our files to them like this, yeah? And they'd be imaged, yeah? And then we have a database here, this is what we said, and they'd have a, their own database at the other end that had the match. Right. So my, job and my team's job was to oversee that to make sure everything was running smoothly. So it's all numbers. And I knew the numbers inside out. I knew all the data, how it should perform, and the relationship so that's what yeah. that role so my job was I, I hadn't done many spreadsheets with it I'm not, not that extent so i was doing spreadsheets to the cows got home yeah so we were importing data from sql into access and then using excel as well and i learned a lot about spreadsheets <laughs> but that way, I, was, I mean i said if only you had the blockchain back hey if only you had the blockchain back then yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, that would be a great answer. But uh, so I sent the course for, for um, all the how to basically do divine stuff on on these spreadsheets, and uh, really most of it was self taught. You know, I just read the book because when they first, this is a good quick good point actually. I, I know I'm rambling. I can tell you, I'm on a roll. So when I was at the company and we first bought computers, in this must have been. 80s and 90s, I don't know when it was, but um, we were lying at the time on some called Display Writer 4, which is before Windows, before Word 3.1, yeah? Right. And that was a Display Writer, so you, you could code it so that you could then print out letters, yeah? And then that disappeared, and then we had Word for the first time, and it was completely different. So I built templates in Word, so that we could go file new and pick a template. I thought there might be 10 templates to respond to generic inquiry. So I built all these bloody letters for the, for the whole department, yeah? And they all had to do was fill in the gaps. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, easy. So we used Word 3.1, and we at the time we were using Lotus 123, which is another spreadsheet system, yeah? Do you know that one? I, I don't know it, though. No. <laughs> That's 22. <laughs> 22 young. Well, no. <laughs> One, two, three was the go-to system before Excel, yeah? Right. So I, I actually was asked to um, create for the team against, and what's the to count productivity and accuracy? So for example, the way we did this was we had all these different pieces of work. So we classified them into different pieces of work. Each one had a unit time. So let's say this this is the first piece of work. That might be a you know, six minute job, yeah? So right. to do it. And then, for example, you'd have how many you've done that day. So if you've done 10, 10 of them, that's 60 minutes, yeah, or 36 minutes. So doing this allowed you to have a counting module here on Excel to say, or let's just as it was, to say, these are pieces I've done today and these are unit times. And then you can work out productivity and accuracy using a spreadsheet. So I programmed it all into loads of ones for using the book I've got, yeah? Right. And of course, yeah, I got this did it on the book. And then about two years later, they bought an Excel. Oh, don't worry, Bill. It's all going to be completely compatible. It's all going to work fantastically well. Word can integrate with the new word. Excel's going to integrate with that. It'd be easy. Of course, it wasn't. I had the red flag of the whole lot. <laughs> the Excel took me a long time. To say. Hey? This is how you became the numbers guy. Well, yeah, because I, I eventually ended up in, in managed information systems. So I was actually on finance. So we had to deliver all the stuff to the regulators, yeah? All right? So we needed to make sure the numbers added up. So the data I was running was used for the um, directives to report back to regulators. Yeah. Yeah? So I built it. We didn't have any bespoke systems, and they came and inspected, oh, it's going to take uh, all this money and this stuff, but oh, just get Bill to do it, you know? <laughs> I don't know if any guy did it. I had to, to in order to run my team of people, I recruited, I had to know what they were doing. I had to know how many cases we had. 
But what happened was we had a the regulators gave us a waiver for complaints because normally with a complaint on anything you have a certain amount of time to respond to it in financial services so you have to respond within seven days so we've got your complaint and then say and set out exactly how much time you need to investigate the complaint and how often you will give them an update yeah now because we're investigating pretty much millions of policies yeah or pensions yeah there was a waiver granted by the regulator and then apparently one guy that may not i didn't have to follow the complaints process my team didn't have to follow it yeah so we could just take so all the cases in the review were lumped together you've got seven years to complete the whole lot for example yeah right one year some guy in london who had a really big job title forgot to apply for the waiver so the waiver was lost <laughs> so all what happened now was all the case all of the leg legacy work had had no timeline just review them when you can by the end of the seven years. But all the new ones now have to follow this process. All right. I went away on a holiday. Guess what? When I came back, guess what? I had a new job. It's to set up that team. <laughs> I've <got> it. Yeah. <laughs> I had people and train them up and build a system to record all the complaints to make sure we didn't breach any of the of the uh, times. Because I had to get a letter out for every case in seven days. I had to respond, I think it was in 28. With a conclusion, yeah, or a, a first assessment, and then I'd update them every 21 days. So I needed to build a system to do that, yeah, yeah. And this is the killer it didn't matter where that letter came into the company, it could have been, you know, in Scotland or could be anywhere in the operations, not my my department. If it landed in, in the Prudential, I've got the problem down there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If it, landed in the, yeah, if it um, landed in the company, I had seven days to respond to it. So I, I had to make sure that every department knew they had to get it to my team. Yeah. And that was a massive challenge because they've got paper coming in all the time, this company, all these departments. They're under resourced most of the time because most companies are, to be fair, yeah. And um, they didn't understand how important it was. So I'm trying to install people uh, that knew what they were doing. In each department to make sure that if they've got a letter that affects fits this criteria, it comes to my team. And of course, my job is to make sure they don't breach. And guess what? If there's a breach, what happened? The shit fell on me a big time. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I that mad lady I told you about. I was running the team and it was going well. And one day she, she came running and screaming down the department and threw this at me. <laughs> what the <laughs> that? This is the director, by the way. Yeah. And I, she said, you're breaching your, your SLA. I said, I'm not. I'm not breaching any. You should not want to breach. Yeah? And she went off again. So I investigated it. We weren't breaching at all. And I went back to said, we're not breaching any. I said, okay. And she never said anything. That was it. It's the regulator I rang her up and told her we were breaching. So somehow it went wrong. She never explained her why she went nuts at me. Didn't apologize. But she got, she, she's already got sacked, yeah? <laughs> but I mean, you know, that, I love working with that company because it's a good company. They looked after us well. It was just a bad time for at points because you had the wrong people in charge. Yeah, they yeah. didn't understand the business, and really they were egomaniacs, basically. Yeah, and there's a few an online marketing too. <laughs> the is, I think that the people you keep around you is a, a big part of your success. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, you know, to be fair, I mean, I've got a great team behind me. Yeah, I wouldn't be where I am today without their help. Yeah, uh, we work very closely with each other. Um, most of my team are offline people. Yeah, I mean, I've got one, one team who are completely offline. In fact, I'd say probably out of the four teams I have, as a sub team, do you like? Yeah, only one of them is internet, internet people. All the rest. Uh, offline pretty much they don't operate online like you and I do well yeah. I, that's why I do a bit of both because I'm not one or the other I'm a bit of a bit of a, a mongrel really um yeah. the, yeah. <laughs> but, no, seriously though, most of my guys are offline networkers yeah yeah but I built up relationships over time and um they love what we're doing today you know it's an amazing they can see they can build business you know, a business now over over the long term they a lot of them have met the owners, yeah, uh, or whether face to face or on calls, yeah. 
or they're about to because we're going to be having a meeting in London. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm trying to arrange one in Birmingham as well. I might, I don't think, can it off, but we'll try to try and get more to country, you know, taken care of. But it's weird that most of my people, or I didn't design it that way, it just happened that way. Yeah, yeah, it's because I've talked to a few people and I've got to know them over time. And when I show them this new one, or this new struct, this sort of new direction we're going in on the, on the energy, they just love it. Yeah, it's not going to appeal to everyone because it is a, a very different model to most people use. I mean, the, I suppose the comp plan isn't particularly different, but the actual products are different. No one's really seen anyone do this before. Yeah, and the, the first thing they're going to say, scam, well, no one can do that because it's impossible. Yeah, yeah. but it isn't because we've done it. What well, the company has, and what we have now is our generational income and wealth. And uh, we're going to be having gold and silver on the blockchain, and all of it, all of, all of our tokens, because when you look at the blockchain, there's a clear separation, really. Um, you've got cryptocurrencies and you've got tokens. And they're, yeah. they're all tokens where they represent something. So like we used to go to the fair, yeah, there's a lad, yeah? yeah. When you used to go to the fair, you used to, get, used to exchange your money for tokens to use in the rides, yeah? So it's representing a, a medium exchange, yeah? So here we've got cryptocurrency, which is a medium exchange. Now, if you take the last two or three years, it's, it can be summed up like this. Um, 2017 was the year of Bitcoin. Yeah. 2018 was the year of the ICO, which really hurt our, our business. Okay, because ICOs were backed by nothing; they were just spontaneous ideas that really had no grounds to be work at all. Just people trying to make money. Yeah. And this is the owners, and you know, they're on they're on borrowed time because the SEC will be looking at those companies and going to retrospectively find them. I'm sure of that. Yeah. The words are on that one. 2019 is going to be a year of the asset backed token, which is like an ETO or STO. Yeah. So yeah. security token offerings or equity token offerings, or even TAO, which is a tokenized asset offering. Yeah. This is all big words, but what it means is if you, for example, if I find something that's not too rude, <laughs> there's a bottle. So if you pretend this is a physical asset, it could be, a, you know, it could be a condo. Could be your house. Um, it could be commercial property. It could be oil and gas. It could be solar power. This is already an operation that's quite familiar in, in the traditional space. Yeah. So you can go and buy shares in these companies. Yeah. All right. And you have to go to a broker and I pay a bank. And it's all these intermediaries in the way. They take their cuts. And then you pay your money and it settles a few days later. And at some point, you get a, a piece of paper representing. Your, your share of stock, yeah, in the post. And yeah. hopefully you won't lose it, in which case you've got a big problem, yeah? Or it's just old problem, yeah? The blockchain overcomes all this, because what we're doing the blockchain saying, well, here's the blockchain, okay? We're not using the blockchain to create tokens for a cryptocurrency. We're using it, what they are, we're using it to create tokens that represent a stake in the company. So we've taken this traditional business, this brick and mortar business, and say, right, we're gonna tokenize that. So we might use an IPO arrangement to, sorry, not, we might use an IPO to, you know, to raise the funds, yeah, to go yeah. and buy the assets, yeah. Now instead of actually doing an IPO, we're pretty much doing an IPO on the blockchain. So we're saying, right, we're gonna, for example, use a blockchain called Ethereum two two three, yeah. And when you buy those tokens, you become a stakeholder in the company. So now you're a shareholder, if you like, or a stockholder, yeah. Yeah. And that means that when they declare the profits, you get a share distributed for the blockchain to you, yeah? When you come to sell, you can go on the exchange, would be, be a specific or a um, dedicated ETO exchange, because an ETO is not like a, an ICO or like a, um, what do you call it, different sort of operations. So we were dedicated um, ETO exchange, we can sell your tokens for capital growth, yeah? That is pretty much what we're doing. So there's a, there's a, a consensus really that more and more companies will look at that model and say, look, we can take any profitable business in the real world, yeah. and we can plug that into the blockchain. Mm. And that could by like SO and Exxon are looking at this already, yeah. So you've got North Sea oil contracts already stopping the trade in the blockchain in real time. Because what you get from the blockchain is real time settlement. You don't have to wait a few days for the money. Yeah. Typically thinking it is it's straight away. Now, with this particular blockchain, we don't need high-speed transactions like you do on a 
cryptocurrency, we're not going to be trading millions a day, yeah, like currencies are. But we do need, want to settle where we can in real time. So that means when you buy your shares, you have to wait for an email to come through, and maybe the, the share um, paper to come later in the post. That won't happen here because you'll you'll have immediate settlement or very pretty much to it, and then you'll get notified from that. And your tokens are your shares; they're in your wallet. They're in your USB stick, where it might be. Yeah. So this is going to be a completely different way of working. So. It means that any company in the real world space, whether they're, you know, they're selling energy, gold, silver, you know, natural gas, or even a company that's very successful at what they do, it could be a, a digital company that returns real profits. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of using paper shares to issue your share in the company, they can use the blockchain instead. And you've got an increased transparency. Um, and uh, one of the key things for me actually is quite important. It's the barrier to entry. A lot of the things that come along investment-wise, particularly through IPOs, they normally offer to private investors, friends of the family first. Then you have to have a lot of money to get involved, or you need to know the person involved. Yeah, yeah. But it's usually thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, well, I mean, the C of our company, he invested a million back in '04. That was the entry fee, and you only knew about it if someone told you about it, introduced to someone. Yeah. Right. And we're working with the same people he did back in 04. So they've got the experience, yeah? But you don't have to have a million to get involved. So that means when I talk about blowing the barrier to entry, I'm taking all those people in South America, in Asia, and across the world who wouldn't normally get access to this market can get now get started for 50 euros. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the, that's one of the great advantages of the blockchain where it can give. It can really break down those borders, those barriers, and make it make it available to a much wider audience of people that wouldn't otherwise get involved. So it's, it's really going to be a massive change. Um, and that means, of course, instead of fundraising, you've got a bigger audience to pull your funds from. You don't have to go after the millionaires all the time and the, co and the corporates, yeah? You can actually uh, uh, you know, widen your exposure, I suppose, really, yeah? But there's quite a few benefits in there that are quite interesting. I th I'm more excited about what the blockchain can do in terms of how it will interface with companies, bricks and mortar, than I'm about Bitcoin. Bitcoin for me is a hedge, yeah? It's, it's a bit like gold too. So I've got my gold over here, physical gold, yeah? Over here, I've got Bitcoin. I yeah. think if there is a recession in the next two or three years, you could see Bitcoin do that, yeah? It might do gold, yeah? Right now, it's not really getting mass adoption. There are obviously um, developments ongoing, like the Lightning Node Network, yeah? Yep. They're helping it move along, but it really hasn't taking mass adoption but i think shares could see mass adoption because people can understand it they see they're getting a piece of a company i've got a 46 page white paper that explains it yeah it's not yeah. it's just not it's not just a networking company anymore yeah so I, there's going to be a real shift um, of companies towards blockchain initiatives tethering if you like to the real world yeah i think i think when people consider in, investing in bitcoin they're they're hope they're just hoping that the, the price will rise. You know what I say? Hope isn't a strategy. <laughs> I'm not saying don't be in Bitcoin. I just don't just don't pin your whole life on it. Yeah, exactly. You know, well, my my back my my um my kind of uh, summary really was that what is Bitcoin going to do? Because everyone was saying you know before that's going to go to a million or some some sort of number. Yeah, there's a thousand people telling you it's going to go up to a massive price. Yeah. And I don't suppose any of us really believe that, but we like to think it might just happen, yeah? Because it was crazy, wasn't it? Let's face it. But fundamentally, um, you know, how long do you wait before you call it a day? Yeah, well, I, I've always looked at it as just as a payment method. Like, if, if you're in... Um, well, I should go to 20 grand, though, not it? It's great if you have patience, but some people need to eat today. You know, so that's my whole point. There, you see, that that's that's the decision I made. I mean, I still got some Bitcoin. Don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not going to sell it all off, but I had converted some of it to different asset classes to to give me more diversification. And I, yeah. I don't, I'm not really big into ICOs. But I've got two two or three ICO things I'm in, and any reason I've done those because they're actually asset backed. They've got the function behind them is not just hoping the price will go up. It's a bit more than that. Yeah. I mean, I've got one. Where, for example, where the NEC group are involved, 
And uh, basically, they've got a token they're going to use within all the NEC group venues, yeah? That includes premiership football clubs like Liverpool, Everton, Man United, all these big clubs. So they've got a, an audience, I think 29 million people on their database, of which four to six million walk in through the, one of the venues every year. Right. That's four to six million people that can use those tokens, yeah? And then what the idea is that when you're watching the sports arena event or football match or or the O2 arena type thing, you, you come to a break and now you want a pint of beer and some food. And then you're running down, you're trying to get a space in the queue to get your food, aren't you? And there's a big queue, then you miss the goal, you get back, yeah? Right. The idea will be that you can order from your phone and your tokens on your phone, yeah, digital tokens, and it will be received at the kiosk and you pick it up or they deliver it, yeah? So therefore, it's a convenience factor. I mean, you always, we've always been in the hustle of a football match, you know, when you come out at half time, it's a, it's a nightmare, you know? Imagine just walking up and picking it up from the quick queue, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And obviously everyone else is going to be, well, how do you get served so quick? All your tokens? Yeah. So I think that will take off, personally. I'm, I'm not heavily invested. I've only put 100 euros into it, yeah? yeah. But I got 14,000 tokens for my 100 euros, yeah? And there's, an, there's a few more projects around like that that do have real legs, in my opinion, but I'm very selective, yeah? yeah. I don't just jump on them all. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, same. Electronium was probably one of the only ones I went halfway big on. Yeah, that, that's another good one as well. So, you know, there's a few yeah. around, you know, and uh, it's just it's behind it. It's very easy to get carried away and do them all, but I'm, I'm, I'm just selective on what I do. But so, what I'm saying is, all I've done is, is move some of the Bitcoin sideways into other things to give me more of a balanced portfolio. Yeah. And if they all come off, I'll be very happy and I can, you know, buy the wife a new car what she wants, you know. <laughs> No, but that's it's the right way to, to do it. Like having I'd rather have multiple pots and yeah. pay me rather than putting everything into one and going, uh, hopefully that's a good one. Because anything can change over time. Well it can, and I was quite surprised by the reaction on the Bitcoin price, to be fair. It took me by surprise. Yeah. I did think it might recover, but I think we can see very clearly you know, it was, you know, it ha when it hit 20 K, it's only gone one way, isn't it? It's just come straight down. And it, it really hasn't shown any well it's, i'm not gonna say it hasn't shown i just don't think it's a reliable mechanism right now uh so what i from my point of view i didn't want to wait for two or three years i'm sure maybe people didn't either to find out if it would get up again yeah because any when you're hodling you know you're only making money by a couple of gains yeah yeah in the mining when it was working it would make money with going sideways that's what i liked about it but when it came down so far, and that difficulty factor was horrible. It really was. It really killed it, you know. So it changed everything. It did, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a shame, but that's that's what happens, you know. But that that space where we're in is it is it's got to be considered, you know, high risk, yeah, because we're online in the first place, and, and Bitcoin and mining is even more high risk, yeah. Not yeah. in terms of um complete and that's a you know scammy type thing, but it's just the fact that you know it's unpredictable, yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's more um, of a risk mathematically than than scam. Yeah, you know, exactly. You, yeah. Anyone can just sit down and actually work it out. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's real. Like that side of it is real and tangible. Um, but it's still a lot of people don't understand any of this, like tokens or cryptocurrency or or anything, and they're oblivious to it. Well, I think I'm, 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 I understand the blockchain now better than I did when it was on the Bitcoin because I mean. I was, I mean, I, I'll tell you a story. Actually. I have been in Bitcoin a bit longer, actually. I actually, a few years ago, some friends of mine were going to run a joint project to put some Bitcoin ATMs into London and cities in the UK. So we bought some Bitcoin with which to invest in that project. Yeah. And this was quite a few years ago. And I think it was about two or three Bitcoins I bought. And they were probably around the time about $100 yeah. ago. Yeah um maybe less than that i don't know but obviously what well, well not obviously they fell out basically and it, the whole project fell apart <laughs> so we got I, bitcoin. I, I sold those bitcoin yeah and uh, i wish i hadn't done that secondly i invested into a sports betting thing uh a bit later than that and i think i think bitcoin then was about probably two to three hundred yeah and I bought, 
I bought a few of them and invested in, in, in this long running sports betting thing. And of course, a month after I did it, it, it would bust. They, they got hacked because they asked us to get, they asked to get paid in Bitcoin, yeah. All right. They got it at the time. Of course, oh, someone's worth the money. I never, I never could prove it with a, a just a ploy to pretend it'd been hacked or really hacked. But I mean, that was about that's a decent amount of money as well, yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. I went add up those bitcoins. I, I think I I worked out some some pretty decent money, yeah. So I look about back on those early Bitcoin um, finances and thinking. If I just held a Bitcoin, you know, I'll put maybe a hundred grand or something, you know. Yeah. But it, this is what happens in life, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's it. I have a kind of similar story. When I first bought um, my Bitcoins, I think it was a little bit over a thousand dollars. Yeah. And I think I bought eight or nine um, at a go, and I, I was buying them to use um, in a business. Yeah, like, so I was actually buying it and then sending it straight. Yeah. It was about two months later. It the price had just ri- like shot up ri- ridiculously, yeah. and it was it was obviously on that run towards the twenty k. And I remember when I hit twenty k, going, "Jesus! Like if I had it known and just waited, I'd have a you know, stupid amount of money." But even looking back now, when the when the price has gone down, it doesn't bother me because I was like, "I it's just a payment method." I exchanged my, my fiat for Bitcoin. I used it for what I wanted, and I got what I wanted. So the the, the price difference never bothered me. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I was very happy. From, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, that's what it really is. And I think if it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to happen in a developing nation. Yeah. So yeah. The outbreak, if you like, if it's not driven by the economy collapsing, it's going to be driven by people using it more in like uh, African African nations, Asia, and South America, where they find it very hard to exchange their money for something that's got a good store of value because their own currencies are suffering really badly. So I think those are the places you might most likely to see them happen. And I've, I said that a year ago or so, because I could, when you look at Zimbabwe and, and uh, Venezuela, for example, these are the places I expect it to have an effect. And you've got kind of black economies over there for Bitcoin at the moment because the way they they are, I suppose, uh, over, they're ruled by, the, by, their, by their, their premiers, yeah? But that's where I'd expect to see it break out, unless we get a significant seismic event in the financial markets. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to talk about before I forget, actually, because that's just reminded me. I'm, I've done a lot of work looking at banks. Yeah. Not looking at their, necessarily their bank balances, but the way they operate. When we had the last recession, we had these bailouts, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. That's where essentially, you know, the bank, the uh, central bank put in money to bail out the banks to make them more liquid so that would start and, and then said, this, this is what I'm going to give you. And you, we want you to lend to each other again because <laughs> the banks knew there was toxic debt out there. And it was like a bit like past the parcel. They didn't want to take a transaction just in case they were left with the toxic debt. Yeah. Yeah. And they were scared of each other. And uh, there's a very good movie on the BBC iPlayer um, about uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, yeah. And when Alice Darling was the um, was the uh, charge exchequer at the time, and he got a phone call saying, "Look, you've got to get back to the UK <laughs> because we're in deep shit, basically." Yeah. So he was the one who oversaw that the fix that's allowed those banks to become you know liquid enough to start lending and operating because. The RBS was actually relying upon short-term funding from other banks to keep going. And every day they were doing it for, for a long time. Yeah. And eventually these other banks stopped doing it. So no, no more. So yeah. Now, that's what got a run on it. But fundamentally, we had bailouts back then. The bailouts are where to be whether there's a need for liquidity and money is printed and made available by the Bank of England. They made, I think, oh, 500 million available, I think it was, yeah, or something stupid, some stupid number. Anyway, it's going to be different next time around because the EEC, well, the G20 nations had got together in 2014 in Brisbane and they agreed amongst themselves they didn't want to do bailouts anymore, they want to do bail ins. What that means is if a bank fails, they have the ability now to seize the potter's funds and make you a shareholder of the bank. Right. If you've got 50 grand or, or let's say some money in your bank, yeah, 
if they they're supposed to do this from, from now yeah they're supposed to say right we're going to basically uh make all of the depositors uh shareholders the money in that bank is there for use to refund the bank that so the money isn't coming from this you know no one's printing money and putting it into the bank anymore it's yeah. taking existing funds in and saying what we're going to use that to prop up the bank and all of you depositors will become shareholders and you might get it back at some point in the future if you're lucky maybe called google berlin's and there's a document from the uk government that says that's it let's it out very clearly yeah um it's got a very long word i can't remember what it is i'll try and find an image and send it through to you at one point but uh it's got a crazy long word so no one understands it yeah i can't remember yeah. all of it um but this is law amongst all the g20 nations so the quick i have two or three points to make on this one it hasn't really been debated on tv at all why do you, do you expect that thing to be debated on TV? Right, no, quite, though, wouldn't it? no one want, no one would want that no well i think it has been discussed but not in any great detail yeah i mean i think if most people in the uk knew today that the, their um government and their banks had the uh the law behind them to seize their deposited money and use that to you know to basically refund the bank and give them the shares in return that probably quite worthless yeah you yeah. might be a bit concerned about that it's not discussed at any great length but i mean if you google it it's all out on the internet so every country is in the same poll really yeah every citizen now there are there are conditions i think the condition is you have to have, have a certain amount of money in the bank in the first place to qualify but i wouldn't trust them that far yeah no no because if they've got law in place to say we can seize your money if you've got over say 50k or 85k we might be do you think they'll stop at that if they really need that money yeah well that'll just be the uh, phase one and then yeah well i think that's really really bad and if things get really bad and it, the money in the bank isn't enough yeah or the money coming from those qualifying deposits isn't enough they're gonna have to get more aren't they yeah, yeah. now what's happened is the spin spontanean banks collapse or hit problems and in spain as well in recent well i think the last 18 months yeah and those banks and their governments it's italy and spain have resisted deploying this berlin uh, law and the eec are not happy about it because they want them to start using it that's the agreement we have when a bank hits problems you're supposed to now use the berlin model not the not the old bailout model but yeah. the Italians and the Spanish haven't done that so there has been in the papers over the last 18 months it was out there but all I'm saying is that keeping all your funding or money in the bank is not a good idea you need to have money outside the bank now it's not about it to have cash under the mattress for immediate concerns yeah yeah that's why people you know are diversifying into different asset classes like gold silver and also oil and gas and things because when they when you get a situation where the bank's starting to have problems, you need assets behind it because assets are, are monetized. Yeah, yeah. You can sell them. Yeah. I mean, I, I if I if I get to the point where you know um, things are bad, I will have shares I can cash in that, that they're worth money. I can convert them from Ethereum into Bitcoin if I want to because they're, they're yeah. Ethereum shares, aren't they? Yeah. So I can decide where I move them if I wanted to. I can sell those off and put them into gold. So I've got a range of options available to me. So I'm not preaching to people. I'm just saying that Google Berlin's and form your own conclusion. Do you oh, really trust your bank? Everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it's about you know being informed and aware of what's going on in the world and making the best plan you can for it. Because um, fundamentally, when you look at the, the pecking order in a bank, you as a depositor are the, are the one in the bottom step. Yeah. And there's a people above you but um or, or you know preferential you know debtors if you like and they would get paid their money first so that yeah. probably be probably be the the bond holders and the um and, and big banks yeah yeah the world is usually complex usually complex yeah and they also use it use a language that no one it's a bit like being a, a solicitor a lot of the uh, language used by solicitors general people don't understand and it i think it's just to confuse you so that you just go away yeah, I do. I mean, if you look, there's a film called The Big Short. I've, I've actually got on saved on the iPlayer. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I've seen it. It's good. <laughs> I, use, I use it quite a bit in on 
on you I download the uh, YouTube version and I put it on Facebook so they they have the I thought it's, it's very Hollywood I mean, it's a good classy film yeah even of a motor subject and there's points in the film where they are going back to what happened historically and they then put them to the clips and they bring in a, a, a celebrity to explain what the heck they're talking about because it's quite complicated so there's one clip where they're in talking about um derivatives basically they're talking about um what do they call them now look at why it's gone now but, oh my lord i've forgotten the word yeah, that's frustrating um uh, collector i think they are cd cdos i think that's what they call them so basically they have this situation where they've got these celebrities explaining it in simple terms the technical explanation and it was so technical even the banks didn't understand it <laughs> <laughs> i mean and it gets worse it gets worse when you've got you've got companies or organizations like uh uh s p yeah yeah so, Course, which are rating are credit rating agencies and there's three of them that i can't, can't remember what they're now but they're supposed to be independent in arbiters of a bank standing and their stock standing and things like that yeah and also governments as well yeah and um of course they're in competition with each other so they don't want to be the bad guy because otherwise no one will use them will they yeah so what it, in the film it turns out that we can't do that otherwise you won't come back to us basically yeah yeah so, a fixed deck where they're all reporting similar confidence in the banks when in fact what they described it was dog shit. <laughs> yeah so what they had they had these um properties in the states where um the economy or the people over there took the view that everyone pays their mortgage don't they yeah so therefore there's nothing as safe as housing because people pay the mortgage they want to stay in the house but in the end that didn't happen because some people got pissed off as paying the mortgage so they just walked out of the house and just left it like that you have a state sure. of houses over in the states were, which are derelict and, and dormant because people just left them and stopped paying the mortgages so what had happened they the um the banks and the super geeks had basically created things called cdas i think they call them and they you had basically triple a rated which are like the, the best of the best. Then you had a middle one called probably double A, and then you had what they called the dog shit at the bottom. Yeah. So what they had the clever idea of doing, they merged them all together and mixed them all up into a you know a collateral debt, a collateralized debt, which was a blend of it all. And no one knew what was in there. So as far as they're concerned, that was houses. Houses are safe as houses, isn't it? Yeah. So everyone bought bought into the idea. And um when people stopped paying their mortgages, suddenly things got bad because you had an insurance back insurance back system on it you could buy the insurance yeah but basically guaranteed you to be safe yeah but unfortunately um as in the as in explained in the film it got out of hand and uh, they bettered it against the banks you see the, the smart people in the yeah. film and they made a shell of the money but they showed the banks up for what they really are they didn't listen and they didn't know their own products and because they're getting so much commission they were look, they were looked at they looked the other way yeah it's, it's, it's a it's a great film to watch and we're not out the woods yet so that toxic debt it doesn't disappear unless people can actually get to the point where they pay the mortgage against you still got those mortgages being paced, passed around yeah yeah just goes from one book to another yeah so yeah i mean what you find is um I just say watch the film. Those clips are really, I mean, much, much better than I. I'm explaining it right now because I can't remember half the information. It's something you have to watch and you'll realize what happened and you think, bloody hell. And it's not going away because yeah. look at it today, right? You've got, you've got stupidly low interest rates and all these people since 08 have started to buy houses again. Maybe even first time buyers, yeah? And they're still by the day. The, mar the market in the UK is very toppy. And every day there's another article coming out saying, oh, it's coming down, and there's no one said it's going up. You know, I mean, yeah. fundamentally, we've had what, eight, seven, eight, ten years of austerity, yeah, and low interest rates probably came from about 09 onwards, yeah. And we're now seeing people buy houses at low rates, 
which they can afford. Now, what happens when the interest rates go up, the mortgage goes up? Now, that means more than money has to go towards the paying the mortgage. Yeah. That means they've got less money to spend. If they, that means the high street's going to suffer with no one spending money anymore. Yeah. They lose their job because people are losing their jobs and they can't pay the mortgage. What does that mean? It's going to put a squeeze on the market. Yeah. So we are right. Yeah, the the mortgage. It's just, well, I wrote this. I read um, the, the book uh, Rich, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And most people know Robert what we're kind of second. And I used to go to these, um, these uh they got a meeting is about property and one of the things they said there was every seven or five to ten years the house prices double well i, I know i you know I, I almost bought some houses back then i didn't do it in the end i, thought, I had another house but i didn't go massive into the market but today i'm thinking differently i'm thinking I mean, actually it's, it's not that they double every five to ten years it's the, it's the correction every five to ten years yeah. So if the market's doing that, it can be seen as going up. When it comes down again, and then the people who've kept the money in cash come in and buy uh, the distressed sales of the people who couldn't afford to keep the house going. Yeah. They, they are getting property at BMV below market value. Yeah. And then they're seeing the next sort of credit boom. Because now what happens when they come down the bottom is that Normally, credit is reduced or the interest rates are reduced to uh, encourage you to borrow again. More mortgages, more cars, more credit cards, more home loans, yeah? And the house price is up again. And that's a reflection, really, of the boom and bust cycle, yeah? It's actually going down before it goes up. Yeah. yeah? So you're seeing this. Dun, 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 dun. And the, the people, the smart people, wait. To the market crashes and hits the bottom and yeah. buy the houses at bmv and they're the ones who benefit not yeah. the guys who are paying the mortgages and the high interest rates yeah correct that's it. gary vaynerchuk talks about it all the time gary who? When people ask gary vaynerchuk you know gary v is he one who swears a lot yeah he asked him <laughs> <about that. laughs> yeah that's, he talks about buying these like uh, like multi-billion dollar companies yeah and, uh, like why why he works so hard now he's like because i'm i'm getting ready for this next crash he's like and that's when i make my money i'm going to swoop in like a vulture just i want it all yeah yeah i mean it's it's a smart way to do it. i mean you, something might might not see it's ethical because obviously you're preying on people who've got the first home and got themselves in the situation they couldn't couldn't obviously maintain their payments and it's not it's a nice place to be yeah but fundamentally that's where a lot of people make the money. They, it's around being in the right place at the right time and recognizing that the market goes through trends. And if you if you can uh, be in the right place when the trend changes, yeah, that's okay. what the thing. Yeah? Anyway, it's <laughs> <laughs> what time do we start? Uh, I don't. Know. I think we're go we're going a while. We can, we'll wrap it up. We'll, we'll wrap it up. You know, I, I think you might get people asking you some more questions when you see this. Um, I, my rates are very high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can do it. They can compile a list underneath and maybe, maybe we'll do another show in a few months. Well, I, I'm a, you know, I'm not a sophisticated, sophisticated guy. I, I'm pretty much, you know, run from the hip really, a lot of the time. Um, I've learned a lot and sometimes I don't package information that very well, but hopefully there is some information that will be helpful. But the actual, the bailout one is the one I'd recommend you Google, Google it now, Bail, bail-ins it's called, and you'll find plenty of information about it. All the G20 um, nations signed up to that. And it's critical that you consider what your plan for that is, yeah? It might not affect everyone because there are limits they put in there. I think that, they're really aiming at the higher depositors, but I just don't think they'll stop there. Personally, yeah. Big, big, big things are going to change over the, certainly over the next decade. Oh, absolutely, yeah, it's going to change. I mean, when you think about AI and robotics as well, you know, driving. You know, I mean, at some point you might find that you don't need a car anymore because you'll just order one and it'll turn up in the door, take you to where you want to go. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I joke when I don't know how old are you. 25. I mean, I grew up uh, on push bikes without computers and stuff like that. I was it was in the 70s yeah, and 80s, and um, 
and we were so different back then and i can probably sound like an old man now but i'm wondering what my kids are going to face i mean they're all already already mad on ipads and, and computer games yeah yeah and my my son he's mad on top gear my oldest one and they're both mad on top gear because they, they love the fast cars and the clarkson's antics and stuff like that and um, all the lamborghinis and um obviously they're playing computer games as well and i think what sort of world are going to open you know what work will they do um there's been talk of this like this basic international wage so look if you start to automate automate things what jobs will they end up doing we can be overseers yeah yeah. but there are going to be less jobs to go around yeah so the job the job market will change but i'm thinking the, ne- the next the chance of my kids over the next 50 years is going to be huge because we've got climate change we've got too much too many wars guns you know this you know the way that governments are operating and behaving is is very bad yeah and they're not no one is really setting very good examples as role models yeah yeah my dad was my role model but my point is that you know i also looked up to other people when i was a younger young lad yeah i used to read a lot of books i used to read loads of books yeah but these days it's all computers isn't it yeah so you know i'm i my my main thought process around what they're going to end up doing when they become sort of young men yeah yeah what's so going around in 10 years time it's going to be a, a crazy difference that's it. i actually just just um maybe two days ago i took uh, all of ashley's devices away uh just with, i don't know if you heard about this mo this momo app oh yes i saw that yeah there's a lot of a lot of crazy stuff going on and yeah. um, she was a bit upset over it and i said I, i'm not um i don't you don't need to be afraid like just for now it's not a good time to to be online and all this kind of stuff did he so, see come up with me on, on youtube yeah dude, i think it just pops up um but it, mm-hmm. there's numbers you can call and it, it gets a bit crazy like um but she was getting a bit fearful like she didn't want the lights um turned off and all this kind of stuff so i was like no I'm not, just just turn everything off yeah like, don't need it but uh we were talking about like i was trying to explain to her that she's the first generation to t- grow up with the internet yeah I was trying to explain to her like when i when i was your age i was like granddad had a tv with a remote control but it was on a wire attached to the television <laughs> You know, and she's going, well, why? That doesn't make any sense. I was like, no, but it was a huge thing back then. Yeah. I was like, it wasn't like everything was wired, and mm. um, I tried to explain like like dial up broadband or dial up. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And I even got went to YouTube and I, you know, I played the video of the of the yeah. noise and all that. <laughs> yeah, I like, yeah, yeah. Could, you, could you play Fortnite? I was like, darling, there was no Fortnite. I was like, there's none of this stuff. You went outside. You climbed a tree. You read a book yeah it's the world is completely different well it is i'll tell you what that's interesting actually because um i used to play something called doom when i was a teenager yeah yeah years ago yeah in early 20s and it was we didn't have ipads or i don't don't think we had laptops back then and they didn't all the way good ones but we had desktop computers so what we used to do (laughs) is sound insane now we used to have obviously those boxy kind of vdu which is the whole the gray ones yeah yeah and then old, old sort of style keyboards so we used to pick them up and my, we used to go to my mate's house and then we used to network they can used to get cables out to go between the pcs so we'd have one in his bedroom one in the kitchen one on the lounge and one in the spare bedroom yeah so we had four we physically carried these bloody huge great VDU <laughs> in the cars around his house so we could actually play a network game together we couldn't do it over the internet was it fast enough yeah? yeah and that was doom the first doom that came out when the machine gun one yeah yeah i mean you can do it you know on a play iphone yeah um so it has changed a great deal and then that's that's the world i tried to explain to my kids you know we i mean tv stopped at midnight and you had the test trade transmission yeah, that, was it. Yeah. That, that was the other thing i was telling her i was like you know if, if you had a favorite show you had to turn up at the television at that time or you missed it yeah there's no recording why didn't you just record it i was like you couldn't record it we had the vhs come out didn't it and we had vhs and beta and beta got killed off and uh, vhs was a, the go-to one because um then we had really cassette players and you used to have a really cassette player in the car and it used to get tangled up inside there do you remember yeah 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 i mean I, when i went traveling i used they um didn't have ipods back then they had 
oh god the little disc players they're very small and I don't know, mp3s mp3s they were yeah and i think you're so lucky to have an iphone to go backpacking these days because you can it's instant and it's much better quality and those yeah. days i had an mp3 i had to download the cd to get the images and stuff yeah and for photos these days you just put it on on your website your blog yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's easier i had i've got like i've got stacks of cds from my travels going around australia and, and asia i've got yeah. stacks of them right i i used to have, my, have a camera download them onto the go to the internet cafe and have to download them and onto the cd as a copy and then put it in our lucky little satchel to keep them safe yeah and these days it's, it's on the phone it's like this is bigger than the main thing more powerful than the, probably the main thing computer at work yeah yeah <laughs> I, I only thought about it um maybe a few weeks ago so I, was, I was a bit under pressure for time so i, I recorded a video yeah I, I left it to render and i knew when it when it when it hit my desktop when it was rendered and it would sync with my iCloud, it would be on my phone. And I could upload it from my phone to YouTube. And I'm like, da, 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 da. I'm like this is crazy. It is, it is. I mean, that's the thing is that they're gonna grow up thinking what they're doing is normal, whereas to us it's completely abnormal because we had much more challenging, you know, when we didn't we weren't as advanced back then, basically, were we? Yeah. No. We had, I mean, the dial up. Do you remember trying to load websites up and games up? Yeah. It was good. Came like, in my mouth. Like, wake the computer up. <laughs> you might get one, if you're lucky, you got one or two mega RAM. You know, now these days you've got like probably 16 or 17 RAM, you know, and more. You know, so. well, like this computer here is custom built. I had this, my last time to do the trading on the wheel. So I had, I've got, I had four monitors, yeah? Yeah. Custom built super daddy computer it's still here i've lost two monitors they go they've packed up and i haven't replaced them yet because they've gone funny but um i mean this thing was it wasn't mega mega, mega expensive but it's, it's an amazing piece of kit it's so quick yeah really really fast you, you need that when you're trading hmm? you definitely need that when you're trading well you do you do i mean this is an ssd drive so it's very quiet yeah sort of state yeah and the old ones used to be always making noises didn't they yeah the new drives are so quiet, but I, I can't hear a hum at all. There's nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. And this would be your hands kicking in, or you hear something. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we're, we're rambling on again. We better wrap this up, otherwise, um, it's going to be another day, isn't it? <laughs> uh, folks, if you've watched it till now, thanks so much. Uh, there will be some links um, underneath. Uh, but I don't know if you have a YouTube channel, do you? I do actually. I, um, I tend to use it for my business. I mean, what I would say is that um, if you made it this far, you're a hero. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 100%. This is a long one, um, but you've got to fast forward anyway, so you can catch up. But yeah, it's it send me for the raw file, and um, I'll ping it on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's well, where, where's if people want to want to look you up? Is it a YouTube channel a good place to look, or Facebook, or probably what, Facebook. What the best place catch me yeah because i i mean i'm not doing a lot of youtube at the moment because i'm too busy to do so but i have to get back to it um but i mean one of the things i do have is just done, you know you know prem don't you yeah yeah he's an ex-banker um now he did a series of videos about how the financial system works so how the banks work and all these different things we've been talking about tonight and they're really educational yeah so if you wanted a freebie of good information that will help you understand how you know what the world really works yeah yeah in terms of money and banks and so on that's a very good place to start because it'll give you some pointers very good pointers yeah cool we'll get we'll get that into the description then about 12 15 you know videos <laughs> probably more than that actually it goes from gold and silver no i'm not gonna tell you that because that's giving too much away <laughs> If someone has watched till now, they'll have a genuine interest in, in seeing things like that. Yeah, definitely. If you've got any questions, just reach out and um, um, it's free of charge. All right. Yeah. It's, Bill is one of the most ethical people I've, I've ever met, um, offline or online. <laughs> That's <laughs> nice to say so. <laughs> no worries. No worries. I really appreciated you coming on because you've you've gotten the ball rolling again on these for me. And it's very much appreciated. Well, I've got to say, actually, um, I've seen you, you know, obviously take on those challenges that you because everyone's got personal fears or things they wouldn't rather do and i think from what i understand 
being online like this is one of those for you. And you've taken that, you know, that advice, you know, you took it on head on and really gone for it. And uh, I've been watching your progress over the last few months. So I'm, I'm actually qu really quite impressed because you actually know more than me in some respects, yeah? And I think that, you know, you've done really well. You should be really proud of yourself, really, yeah? I, 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 don't, I don't really give myself much, much praise. There's always something else to do. <laughs> you really well, actually, much better than you think you do, yeah? Because I remember seeing you on a course we used to do before, yeah? I think you were on one of the other And uh, I took place on those hangouts. And I think you're actually really good, better than you think you are, yeah? I think most people are. They they just look at their when you look at yourself in the in mirror, you always look at the, the things that you think people see, yeah? But yeah. other people see things that you that you, you don't see, yeah? Yes. So um I think you can be very proud of yourself, mate. All right. Appreciate it, Paul. Thanks very much. <laughs> That's it. We're just gonna quickly move along. <laughs> don't cry. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. I look behind the post. I'll see you all uh, next week with uh, another new guest. Thanks very much for watching. See you then. Cheers, guys.